All right, so if you've been with us, you know that all summer long we are walking through the book of Genesis, all right, uh, looking at the four major characters as they present themselves throughout this book. We started with Noah, Abraham, Jacob, and now we are transitioning to the final character we're going to look at, and that is a character by the name of Joseph, a man who I love to study, a man who I love to look at in Scripture. In fact, when I was thinking about Genesis, this was a man's story who I couldn't wait to get to because I just love so much about what it says here in Joseph's story and in his life, so much that it has to teach us as we attempt to walk with God ourselves, all right? In Romans chapter number 12, verse number 10, the Bible says this, Love one another with brotherly affection. Think about that word, brotherly affection. And it says, outdo one another in showing honor. Love one another with brotherly affection. Well, today I want to speak to you on a topic that I've simply entitled, Not So Brotherly Love. As we look at the story of Joseph, and we are introduced to this character this morning. So as I begin, let me ask you a question. How many of you in the room today, and if you're online watching on Facebook, go ahead and chime in in the comments and let us know if this is you as well. How many of you are an only child? Any only children? Oh, that explains a lot as I look around. All right, only children. All right, there you go. Well, I did not have that privilege, right? I was one of three. I have one brother and one sister. And as you look at it, there are probably a lot of advantages to being an only child, right? You didn't have to share any of your things with brothers or sisters. You didn't have to compete for your parents' affection or attention or time. You didn't have to worry about wearing hand-me-down clothes from an older sibling but you kind of got the best of everything as an only child, right? So there are some positives to being an only child, I'm sure. I've never experienced it except for the first year and a half of my life. But um, <laughs> after that, everything changed. And, uh, but there's also, I would think, growing up with siblings and having children of my own, I would also think there's some disadvantages of being an only child. Wouldn't you agree? Um, for instance, an only child doesn't get the joy of companionship and developing those relationships closely with brothers or sisters. They don't get the opportunity to learn from the mistakes of a sibling, right? I know it's sometimes easier, especially if you're a younger sibling, to watch and see what your older brother or sister do and learn that oh, I better not do that way and I'm going to butter up mom and dad this way, unlike what they did and, and all those kind of things. And so when you're an only child, you don't have those opportunities. And as an only child, the other thing you don't get to do is you don't get to experience sibling rivalry firsthand, right? Don't get to experience sibling rivalry firsthand. How many of you who have siblings know what I'm talking about when I say sibling rivalry? All right, good. Yeah, so you guys know what I'm talking about. Any sibling relationship worth its salt is going to have a steady diet of sibling rivalry. Having kids myself, I certainly see this to be true. And as I think back in my own childhood, I saw it to be true as I grew up as well. Because when I look at my family, it seems like pretty much anything kids can do that can be turned into a competition will become a competition. And so sometimes as parents, right, you use that to your advantage. I know sometimes, especially with the little ones, when we're trying to get them ready for bed. It's like, okay, guys, we're going to have a race. Who can go and who can get their jammies on the fastest? Right? And so it's a race as you use that sibling rivalry to your advantage. But other times it drives you nuts because it's like everything you do is a competition. This past week we had the opportunity to uh, kind of get away from home, uh, kind of a staycation. We had some friends who were away on vacation. They live over on the lake. And so they said, hey, you can use our house. And so they had pretty much anything our kids could like. They had a golf cart, which was great because we don't have one. They had a hot tub, which was nice. And they had access to the beach. So my kids loved it. They thought it was a vacation and we only went like 20 minutes down the road. And so I could still do stuff I need to do here. And it was beautiful. But as we rode, one of the things they loved to do of everything that was there is they loved to drive the golf cart. Because when you're out in those neighborhoods, you can kind of put them on your lap and you can push the pedal and you can let them drive. And, and so my older girls were at the point where they could actually reach the pedals as well. So for them, this is like a brand new thing. Like not only getting to steer a golf cart, but actually pushing the pedals, like they were amazed. But what did it turn into? A competition, right? Daddy, which one of us is a better driver? 
right? So every day they're trying to outdo the other person as far as who is the better driver. My boys, pretty much anything becomes a competition. They have played with their matchbox cars and mine's faster than yours. No, mine's faster than yours and everything is a competition, right? Because you have this civil sibling rivalry firsthand. As we Look at the world around us. We see sibling rivalry all over the place. Let me give you a few examples that manifest itself in the sports and pop culture world. For instance, we probably all heard of Peyton and Eli Manning, right? All of you football fans. Although Peyton is the older brother and probably the more talented quarterback, if we're honest, Eli actually won just as many Super Bowls as his brother, right? Both of them won two. But there was a sibling rivalry. I'm sure they had all growing up, and it's fun to read about some of those stories. Then you have it in the tennis world, right? Venus and Serena Williams, who, when they team up as a doubles team, are almost unstoppable, almost impossible to beat. But yet, as singles player, the the head-to-head matchups can get pretty intense and pretty ugly as they compete with one another. In fact, in their own right, both of them individually are probably considered two of the best women tennis players to ever play the game of tennis. And the sisters have met a total of 31 times in professional tournaments. And even though Venus is the older of the two, Serena owns a head-to-head record with 19 wins compared to Venus's 12. But there's this constant sibling rivalry that manifests itself, right? So we see it in sports. We see it in other areas of pop culture as well. For instance, the Jonas Brothers, right? After selling millions of records as just that, the Jonas Brothers, what happens? Nick Jonas and Joe Jonas split up in 2013 due to what they labeled a deep rift within the band. That's what they said. So sibling rivalry, right? They all kind of wanted to do their own thing. And then after pursuing their own careers, They did eventually get back together and then released a new album and then the pandemic hit and things like that. But sibling rivalries are pretty much as old as time. In fact, you go back in the history of the Bible, the very first children that were born, Cain and Abel, what happened? Cain murdered his brother Abel. So we see sibling rivalry going all the way back to the beginning of time. We've seen it as we've walked through Genesis, not only with Cain and Abel, but with Jacob and Esau, right? We said that Jacob was constantly competing with his brother. He came out of the womb grabbing his brother's heel, and he was a deceitful man, always trying to get the one up on his brother. But today we're going to look at a sibling rivalry that's probably more famous than any of them, and that is Joseph and his brothers. Now, it wasn't just a sibling rivalry between him and one brother, like we saw with Joseph and Esau. Jacob had 11 brothers, and so I'm sure the sibling rivalry in this family was intense, all right, competing with one another, and we're going to see how that manifests itself into many problems for Joseph down the road. So as I said, Joseph is one of Jacob's 12 sons. He's the second youngest, but he finds a special place in his dad's heart because he was the first son of Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. If you remember the story, Jacob intended to marry Rachel. He was tricked into marrying Leah. He had children with Leah and her maidservant and Rachel's maidservant and Rachel. And so he's got 12 boys by all these different wives. And it's just a mess, right? The soap opera gone, uh, gone wrong. And, and that's what we see here in Jacob's story. And so or Joseph's story. So last week, we concluded the story of Jacob by really looking at how despite Jacob kind of being this constantly up and down, kind of on this roller coaster of life, one minute he's pursuing God, the next minute he's living in the flesh and all those things. But yet despite the constant ups and downs that were demonstrated in Jacob's life, we saw that God's grace was constantly pursuing him, God's grace was protecting him, and God's grace was empowering him to live out God's purposes. And so that brings us now to his son Joseph, that we begin here in chapter 37. And so for the rest of the Bible, or the rest of Genesis, we are going to be looking firsthand at Joseph's story. And of all the people mentioned in Genesis, Joseph's story is given the most detail, more than Abraham, more than Isaac, more than Jacob. Of all these patriarchs, we find more pages devoted to Joseph than any of those individuals. In fact, as you look at the book of Genesis, the creation of the cosmos was covered in just one chapter. But yet the story of Joseph covers 13 chapters. Isn't that interesting? He devoted one chapter to the creation of the world, and yet 13 chapters to 
Joseph. So why? Why would he spend so much time looking at the life of Joseph? Well, I think there could be many reasons for this. First, his story is going to teach us a variety of important lessons when it comes to our own walk with God. As we walk through Joseph's story, we're going to see so many things that are applicable to us as we, you know, uh, live out a Christian life, as we try to walk with Jesus in our daily lives. Secondly, of all the patriarchs, we're going to find that Joseph is by far the most righteous. His heart for God is undeniable and so it just makes sense that his life would be the one that is given greater prominence in Scripture than all the others, right? Because we saw so many faults and so many failures with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But yet in Joseph, some commentators, in fact, say that not a single sinful act is attributed to only two characters in Scripture, two main characters. That is Daniel and Joseph. Now, does that mean they were sinless? Absolutely not. But with most Bible characters, you get to see kind of the raw, the ugly side of their humanity. With Joseph, you don't really get kind of privy to any specific sinful act of Joseph. Now, we know he was a sinner, obviously, but yet he's, he's kind of presented in a light that is really more righteous than, than most other people. And so... Another reason might be that of all the Bible characters, Joseph is probably the greatest type or the greatest picture we have of Jesus than any other in the pages of Scripture. And as we go through his life, you're going to see many parallels that can be seen between both his life and the life of Jesus. So there's many reasons why Joseph might be covered in great detail. But I do know this. Whatever the reason is, God gives us many chapters of Joseph's story to teach us a lesson about what it means to walk with God. So as we dive into Joseph's story today, we're going to see in the beginning of his story, this sibling rivalry kind of takes center stage. So we read with me, if you will, the entirety of Genesis chapter 37. Hopefully you have a Bible in front of me. If not, it is on the screen. I'm going to begin reading in verse number one. We're going to go all the way through the chapter, so bear with me. And then we're going to look at kind of three important kind of truths I want to uh, kind of focus in on today as we look at this chapter and begin Joseph's story. So it says in verse number one that Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings, in the land of Canaan. So right off the bat, we are kind of giving, giving this picture of where they are at. Jacob has been sojourning. Now he is in the land of Canaan. He is settling. Chapter 36, which we didn't take the time to cover, has just gone through the genealogy of Esau, right? Jacob's brother. And so it's shown us kind of all of his descendants. And we see how God has just given him a multitude of, of family members and a multitude of descendants. And then we get to chapter 37, where in verse number two, it says, these are the generations of Jacob. Now, this is going to be the ninth time in Genesis that we see this phrase, these are the generations of. And this is going to be the final time in Genesis that we see this, all right? And so we're given now the descendants of the generations of Jacob, and it's going to be interesting because it's going to then focus in on Joseph, who's not the oldest son by any stretch, but yet the one the story is going to kind of curtail to. So Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bil. He was with the, a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons, because he was a son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that, their father loved him more than all his brothers. And they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brother said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and 11 stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the saying in mind. 
Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a man found him wandering in the fields, and the man asked him, What are you seeking? Why, I'm seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. And the man said, they have gone away, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. And they said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, He rescued him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into the pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and I, I, where shall I go? Then they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the rope in the blood. And they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to the father and said, This we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. And he identified it and said, It is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Sheol to my son, mourning. Thus His father wept for him. Now verse 36. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. So you don't have to look very far in this story to see the animosity that existed within Jacob's children. And so today I want to draw your attention to three main ideas regarding this story that we find here in chapter 37, as we kind of lay the foundation for Joseph and what God is doing in the midst of all these hardships that he's going to encounter. So let's pray, and then we'll dive in together. So Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you for the truth of your word, and Lord, just the honesty of your word. And we read a story like this, and Father God, just see how relevant it is. And in our culture, in our context, because we still see these kind of relationships manifesting themselves over and over again and between siblings and, and friends and all these kind of things. And so, God, I pray that, Father, in these next few moments as we look into your word, that you will challenge us, you will encourage us, and you will help us, Lord, to strive to be people who strive to be like Joseph as opposed to many of the other characters we see in Scripture. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we begin, I think the first uh, thing we see in this chapter in Joseph's story is the sour relationship that exists between he and his brothers. Now, you don't have to look very far to see kind of the bitterness and the things that the resentment that is there on behalf of his brothers towards Jacob. And so despite Jacob being the father of many children, we see the focus here of this story And the focus of Jacob's genealogy really being on son number 11, the son by the name of Joseph. Now, obviously, he was the firstborn son of Rachel, but in the lineup of things, he's actually son number 11. 
So it's kind of interesting in the beginning that we're even seeing his lineage kind of being seen here. And we're seeing the story kind of go into him because usually it was a firstborn son that would receive this kind of attention. And so we're introduced to Joseph, this 17-year-old boy. And it's very clear that he is not well liked by his siblings. Would you agree? In fact, there are multiple feelings we see demonstrated towards him here on behalf of his brothers. If you look at verse number um, four, it says, but when his brothers saw their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. So we see they hate him. You jump over to verse number 11. It says they are jealous towards him. And so, obviously, not very fond feelings do they have of their brother Joseph, right? Would you agree? The word hate, the word jealous aren't usually two words you would uh, use to describe someone you are affectionate towards. And so, what is the reason for such animosity? What is the reason for this hatred and this jealousy? Well, really, it's two things. It's twofold. First of all, it was the favoritism showed to to him by their father, And can I tell you, parents, a surefire way to turn away the heart of a child is for a parent to play favorites amongst their children. You are setting yourself up for disaster when you you obviously show favoritism towards one child over another. Now, do some children have different gifts and abilities and uniqueness to them than others? Yes. And does your personality maybe match up to one of your children's personalities better than other children? Yes. But as a parent, you need to do all that you can to strive to love them and show affection towards them as equally as you can. Because when you begin to play favorites, as we're going to see in this story, you are laying the groundwork for children being upset and angry towards you as a parent. And so every one of our kids should feel that they are loved just as much as their siblings. But unfortunately, when it came to Jacob and his fathering of all of his children, that was not the case. In fact, favoritism was something he knew firsthand. If you remember Jacob's story, you know that his own parents showed favoritism in their relationship, right? When we looked at Jacob's story, it said that Jacob was loved more by his mother, Rebecca, while his brother Esau was loved more by their father, Isaac. And so there was favoritism in his household. It's really what he knew. And so he had the opportunity to break that stronghold and break that trend, but yet he chose not to. He chose to display obvious favoritism towards his son, Joseph, the son that was born to the wife he loved the most, and, and is laying the groundwork for just this sibling, sibling rivalry that is going to turn out to be a disaster. And so the reasons for this preferential treatment are clear. Obviously, like I said, he's the son of the favorite wife, Rachel. But not only was his love for Joseph seen through how he treated the boys, it was also seen in kind of some of the things that he did for Joseph and the gifts he gave to Joseph. Notice here in the story that it says that he gave Joseph this coat of many colors, right? Now, growing up in Sunday school, it was always like fun to kind of paint Joseph's coat, right? You paint it all different colors and you think, wow, it's this colorful robe and that's distinguishing him from all his brothers. But I was interested in learning this week as I was studying for this message that it really isn't about the color of the robe that was significant. In fact, let me tell you what a commentary by R. Kent Hughes says. It says this, this designation many colors is arbitrary and derived from the Septuagint and Vulgate translations. All right. Um, It may have been the coat may well have been colored and ornamented, but likely the term describes a sleeved coat that reached to the wrists and ankles, thus setting Joseph apart as the one who would receive the double portion of the inheritance. So it wasn't so much about the colors of this robe. When you look at the original language, it actually speaks more of this long sleeved coat that that he would have been given. Now, now remember, the brothers were in the field, right? And they were farmers. They were, uh, you know, taking care of the flock. And so it was custom in those days that they would have a, a short sleeve robe there out in the hot sun, and, and that would have been common. But Joseph gets this colorful robe that 
has long sleeves. And in, in that culture, this long sleeve robe represented a person of authority. One who wasn't necessarily getting dirty and, and doing those things, but one who was kind of overseeing everything, more of a management type of role. And that is the coat that Joseph is giving, indicating to his brothers that when the father sees things, that Joseph, the 17-year-old, is the one he is putting in charge and he is putting over his brothers. And so he has this coat, probably of various colors, that has long sleeve, and it's obvious by the gift that Jacob is favoring Joseph, putting him in authority over the other brothers. And, and in that, saying that Joseph is the one who's going to receive all the blessings and the benefits of being the firstborn, receive the double portion, receive all those things that the firstborn would receive, as opposed to any of his older brothers. So obviously, that created and paved the way for their hostility, their jealousy, their hatred of Joseph. And so we've all probably seen something similar to this play out. We've all probably been in situations where we felt overlooked at times, and we felt that somebody else was getting an unfair you know, advantage over us. And that's really probably where all of Joseph's brothers were. They they felt betrayed by their father. They felt overlooked by their father. They couldn't believe that their father would put so much stock in Joseph, this 17-year-old boy, as opposed to any of the older brothers. So we see one of the reasons for this favoritism was, or one of the reasons for this jealousy and hatred was a favoritism shown by their father. It was obvious that Jacob loved Joseph more than the other brothers. But another reason for their hatred and their jealousy, I think, comes back to the very character of Joseph and who he was as a person. As if their father's favoritism was not enough, Joseph also fell prey to their hatred because of his godly character. Because all throughout Joseph's story, you see a man, whether he's a teenager or on into Egypt as a story will go, as a grown man, we see this man who just has this heart and this trust and this just deep relationship with God as he knows God to be. And so it's, it's kind of funny. As you study different commentaries, and they, they look at this passage, and, and it's kind of seen differently. Some people look at it and say Joseph was kind of being kind of your typical 17-year-old teenage boy who was kind of poking fun at his brothers as he goes and gives this evil report, and he goes and shares his dreams, and it's almost a way of saying, ha-ha, look at me, this is who I am versus you. Others say that's not really it at all. He's actually just being honest and truthful as he's trying to, you know, do the right thing. He knows his brothers are in the field. They're not doing what they're supposed to do. And so he delivers the truthful report to his dad and says, hey, this is what's going on. And so his brothers hate him because he is a man of character. He's a man who speaks truth. And then God gives him these dreams that we looked at, right? The first dream where his sheaf was there and all the other tree sheaves were bowing down, indicating that what God was saying in this dream was that one day he would rule over his brothers and they would bow down to him. And then another dream where the sun and moon and the 11 stars were giving homage to him. Again, this is all a prophetic dream of what is to take place in the future. And I think in many ways, God is encouraging Joseph with these dreams because what Joseph's going to go through in this story is going to be pretty incredible. And so God's kind of giving him a, a taste of what is to come to encourage him as he faces all these difficulties. But the, the situation is the brothers are jealous. They're hateful because there's favoritism being shown by the father but then Joseph's character is one that is above reproach. He is a man who has a heart for God. He is a young man who is seeking after God, trying to do the right thing. And because of these reasons, his brothers have had enough. And in deep in their souls, they are looking for an opportunity that they can rid their lives of Joseph and get rid of this thorn in their flesh, which brings us to the shameful response that we see as we continue on in the story. So the first 11 verses or so show this sour relationship between Joseph and his brothers and what it was that caused the hatred and the jealousy on their behalf. And then we get to the rest of the story, starting in verse number 12, and we begin to see the shameful response that takes place 
because of their hatred and because of their jealousy. The Bible says his brothers went out to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. Now, Shechem would have been about 50 miles away from where they would have been. All right, it would have been about 50 miles away. And so he goes and he, his father sends them to go check on his brothers to see how they're doing. And when he gets to Shechem, he finds that they are not there. And so he finds somebody there in the land and says, hey, I'm looking for my brothers. Have you seen them? And he says, yeah, they've gone to Dotham. And so then he travels a 14 or so miles to Dotham. So as we read this story, sometimes we think that Jake, Joseph's just kind of going down the street to find his brothers. But it's actually a several days journey that he is traveling here. So he's outside of his father's protection, right? He's kind of not right down the street. He can't just run home to mommy and daddy and say, hey, they're bullying me. They're beating me up. They're picking on me. No, he is like several days journey away from home. And so as they see Joseph approaching, they come up with a scheme of how they can get rid of Joseph once and for all. Understandably so, right? I mean, he's favored by dad. He's got all the benefits of the firstborn, and yet he's number 11. And they're just sick and tired of daddy doting on Joseph all the time. And so now here he is, many, many miles from home, in their territory, in their turf, and they say, all right, now it's time to exact our revenge. Now it's time for us to give Joseph what is due. And so they scheme and they say, hey, let's just go and let's kill him and, and we'll just get rid of him. And, and they discuss and say, no, let's not shed his blood. Instead, let's just throw him in this pit. And, and Reuben speaks up and says, no, don't kill him, don't kill him. Because understand, Reuben is the firstborn, legitimately. Now, he kind of messed things up in the previous chapter, which we didn't take a whole lot of time looking over, and he ended up sleeping with one of his father's wives. And so he's kind of, you know, painting himself out of the picture in some ways. But yet, he's still the one responsible for all the other brothers. He's still the one who kind of is in charge here. And so he's trying to kind of get back into good graces probably with his dad. And so he says, no, no, don't kill him. Instead, throw him into this pit, this cistern that has, is dried up. Because his intention was that he would come back later and rescue Joseph and save him so that that way, because he's the one in charge, he's the one that's going to be held responsible, he can make sure Joseph doesn't die under his watch. But apparently Reuben is overseeing many flocks, and so he kind of goes away, and the brothers decide, okay, we'll put him in this pit, but then they see some Ishmaelites traveling from a distance. And they say, you know what? This is our chance. Not only can we get rid of Joseph, we can make a few bucks in the process. And so instead of just leaving him there in the pit, they sell him as a slave to the Ishmaelites. And then they come up with this deceitful scheme, right? They take him, strip him of his coat, and they, they slaughter an animal and put the blood all over it and then go home to daddy and say, hey, is this your son's coat? We found it out there and then what's left there? Then Jacob's left to jump to conclusions on his own, right? So the same deceit we saw in Jacob is now being manifest in his boys. They've crafted this great plan, this great scheme. They've gotten rid of Joseph. They've made money in the process. And they haven't all come out and said Joseph was killed, but they let daddy jump to those conclusions on his own. And so we see the shameful response of these brothers. And as they get home and tell dad what has happened, we see dad is just heartbroken. His teenage son is dead. He knows there's no chance of him ever seeing him again. And it says, for days he mourns for the life of his son. Because from Jacob's perspective, for everything he knew, Jacob was dead. Never to see, be seen again. But little does he know that in the future, there is going to be a reunion day with Joseph. And that's why I love this story so much. We see just God's providential hand at work in it all, which then brings us to verse number 36. Because we have all this taking place and all these things going on and jo Jacob being in tears, mourning the loss of his son, and verse 36 is going to set the stage for what we're going to see as we continue on in the story, and it says this. Meanwhile, 
So while all this is going on and there's weeping and crying on behalf of Joseph or jo- Jacob, it says, meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. And so that brings us to the last thing I want us to see today, and that is a significant reality of Joseph's story as we are seeing it painted here in chapter 37. We saw the sour relationship between him and his brothers. We saw, this, uh, we saw after that the shameful response and what they did to get rid of their brother and to get him out of the picture. But now we see the significant reality, and that is this. Well, in Jacob's mind, it looked like Joseph was gone. Providence would have it that Joseph was exactly where God wanted him to be. Because what God is doing in Joseph's life is he is preparing a man who is one day going to save multitudes because of his leadership over a famine. And he knows just the man he has in mind for the job. It's this man, Joseph, this man who has a heart for God, this man who has integrity, this young boy who has demonstrated a willingness to lead and to lead faithfully. But in order for him to get in that position where he's one day going to save the lives of many, God needs to get him to Egypt. He needs to get him into Potiphar's house. He needs to get him in prison. He needs to get him up to where he's kind of second in charge in Egypt before he can ever do what it is that God's calling him to do. So what seems to be a setback in Joseph's life is actually a setup for what God is about to do. Isn't that good? That he is setting Joseph up for a future of great glory and a future where he is going to be used in ways he never even began to imagine. And those dreams he had dreamed were going to come true But it was going to happen after years of tribulation and hardship and difficulty and testing. But meanwhile, as all that's going on in Jacob's house, God is preparing a man named Joseph because he has big plans for Joseph's life. And the thing I love about Joseph's story is that as we see him going through all these things, even in this account, I mean, can you just imagine what it must have been like as he's in this pit and they're sitting there on the outside of the pit eating lunch, just laughing, mocking him, saying, what now, Joseph? And he's, he's just crying out to them and calling each of them my name, saying, please, get me out of here. I don't mean anything by it. And he's desperately trying to get out, and they're just laughing hysterically because they now have the one-up on their brother, Joseph, and there's nothing he can do about it. But yet, despite all the questions and I'm sure all the doubts and all the things running through his mind, one thing we never see from Joseph and everything he's going to go through is we never see a man who turns his back on God, who questions God, who doubts God, who complains to God. We always see a man who faithfully just rests and trusts in what God is doing in his life, no matter how hard things get. And that's what I want us to see from Joseph's story this morning. Is that no matter how hard things got for this 17-year-old boy in this particular instance, and we're going to see it over and over again, never once does he complain to God or blame God or doubt God, but yet always we see him trusting in the God who had given him these dreams that told him that one day he's going to rule over his brothers. So the question then is this, do we trust God enough to know that he is working even in the most challenging situations of our life? Because it's easy to trust God on the mountaintop when we can see clearly what's ahead of us and the view is great, right? But it's a whole lot harder to trust God in the middle of the valley when we have no idea what is ahead and it's foggy and dark and blurry and we don't know what the next few steps hold. But yet we see in Joseph's life a man who not only trusted God when things were good, but a man who trusted God when he was at rock bottom and when everything was going wrong, when his brothers had abandoned him and and sold him into slavery and he had no idea what was ahead. We see a man who is faithfully trusting God. 
It's easy to trust God on the mountaintop when everything is peaceful and serene. But it's something completely different to trust him in the valley when the winds are blowing and we can hardly see in front of us. I love this quote by Charles Spurgeon. I encourage you maybe to write it down and to take mental note. And it says this, God is too good to be unkind and he is too wise to be mistaken. And when we cannot trace his hand, we must trust his heart. Can I say that again? Because I think it bears repeating. God is too good to be unkind and he is too wise to be mistaken. And when we cannot trace his hand, we must trust his heart. So when the storms and the challenges of life come our way, we can choose to cry out in fear and doubt, or we can be like Joseph and calmly rest in him and wait and watch him work. Because Joseph's going to find out that in everything going on in his life, even though he didn't understand how it all was being fit together, the providence of God was at work. And God was moving him like a pawn on a chessboard, exactly where he wanted him to be, because he had great plans in store for Joseph. And can I remind you that God has big plans in store for you, but we need to be like Joseph and be willing to trust even when things don't look very promising. So Joseph's story here in Genesis 37 should remind us of another far greater than Joseph who was also despised and rejected by his brethren. Right? John 15, 25 says this about Jesus, but the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. And we see so much here in chapter 37 in Joseph's life that parallels the life of Jesus. He was hated by his brothers. He was rejected. He was stripped. Joseph was thrown into a pit. Jesus was beaten and taken to a cross. And like Joseph, who would be taken out of the pit to eventually save many through a famine, Jesus would be taken from the cross. He would be buried in a tomb one day to rise again three days later to save mankind from their sin. And so just like Joseph was going through all of this for a purpose, so Jesus endured everything he did on the cross for a purpose, to save you and to save me and to give us the opportunity to be in relationship with God forever. And so it's a beautiful picture here that we see not only of Joseph and his walk with God, but he presents for us a type or a picture of Jesus, a man who was despised by the world, who was stripped and beaten and mocked and hung on a cross, but it all happened for a greater purpose so that he could save the lives of all mankind. And so the question we need to ask ourselves is, number one, do we know the one far greater than Joseph that Joseph's life is picturing? Do you know Jesus personally? Is he your Lord? Is he your Savior? Do you have a relationship with him? Because if you don't, what I talked about before about being able to trust him and the difficulties of life will not be possible. Because it's hard to trust one that you do not know intimately. So before you can ever trust him in the valleys and the hardships and the difficulties of life, you must first know him and be in relationship with him. And then once you're in relationship with him, then you can see his peace overcome the fears that are around you. You can see the hope that he gives in the midst of the difficulty. You can see the calmness that he brings in the, life, in the midst of life's most challenging situations. But until you know him like Joseph knew his God, those things cannot be a reality. So my challenge to you today is twofold. Number one, do you know him? In the same way that Joseph knew him. He wasn't just some distant God, but he was a personal God that was working in Joseph's life. And then secondly, do you trust him in the same way that Joseph trusted him? That when everything else was falling apart and nothing seemed to be making sense, Joseph never complained, he never argued with God, he never questioned God, but he simply trusted God 
knowing that God was working on purpose for a purpose. And all he had to do was just rest and wait and see what God was going to do. So, Father, we thank you for the truth of your word that is uh, presented to us here in Joseph's story. And, God, I thank you for the wonderful example that Joseph is. And, Father, I pray that as we look at a character like Joseph, we will not allow ourselves to think something along the lines of, yeah, well, that's Joseph. That could never be me. Joseph was a man just like we are. He was skin and bones and flesh and struggled with sin and faced temptation. All the things that we go through in life, Joseph dealt with as well. But yet he had a trust in you and a faith in you and a belief in you that helped him conquer all those things that he faced in his life. And so, God, I pray for each and every person on the sound of my voice that now that your word has been opened and your word has been presented, that your Holy Spirit will go to work in our hearts and will challenge us and convict us. Maybe, for one, it's the challenge that they need to simply step out and for the first time enter a relationship with you. Not just believe in you in their heads, but truly enter a relationship with you personally in their heart. And maybe for some of us, it's that we need to, like Joseph, learn to trust you and trust your heart, even though we can't trace what your hand is doing. And God, maybe for others, it's something completely different than what we've talked about today, that your spirit is stirring up within us. But God, I pray that as we take the time to sing one final song of response, that you will help us to not stiff arm the Holy Spirit and what he's trying to do in our life, but that we will open our hearts up to your spirit and we will allow him to minister to us and encourage us and challenge us so that we can leave here being changed by you and not simply having come and done some religious experience. So God, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So again, I don't know where this run lands in the runway of your heart, but I do pray that as the word of God has been opened and preach this morning. The Spirit of God will go to work in your heart. If you're watching online today and you know that your greatest need is that you need to receive Jesus as your personal Savior, he's not just some distant God that you need to believe exists, but you need to understand that Jesus died so that you could be in a personal relationship with Jesus. And he's calling you to not only believe, but to repent, to turn to him, turn away from your sin and turn to him. And so if that's you and you're watching online today, can I encourage you, text the word surrender to the number you're going to see on your screen because there's no magic in that text. We simply want to help you begin this journey with Jesus. Maybe that's you today and you're here and you know, you say, you know what, Pastor Justin, the thing I need is I need to have a relationship with Jesus that's real, that's vital, that's impactful in my life. Not just a head knowledge, but a heart knowledge. Can I encourage you as we sing Simply cry out to Jesus, share your heart with him, and let him know that you need him in your life. And if that's you, make sure you see me or find somebody, tell somebody about it before you leave today. Maybe for the rest of you, it's simply an encouragement today that you need to trust God. You're facing a difficulty, a health situation, a, you know, I'm not sure what the future holds. I've heard many people have come to me say, man, I, I need to get out of this apartment and I need to find something, but there's nothing there. I don't know what it is, but I know this. You can trust God because he is Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. And whatever it is in your life, if you will just trust him completely and not lean on your own understanding, as it says in Proverbs, but with all your ways, acknowledge him and trust him. I promise you, Jehovah Jireh will come through. It might be just in the nick of time, but he will come through. But it means that you have to trust him and trust him completely. Not just dip one toe in the water, not just say, okay, I'm going to kind of do it. No, it's you're going to dive in and say, God, I trust you because I know you're working in my life. So whatever it is, as we sing this song and you sing lyrics on a screen, allow the Spirit of God to minister your heart and respond to what it is the Holy Spirit is trying to do in your life. So let's stand, let's sing, and uh, let's worship together.